Уважаемые гости и участники Московского международного форума инновационного развития «Открытые инновации». Начинается пленарное заседание «Новая инновационная карта мира. Как уменьшить технологический разрыв между странами». Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests of the Moscow International Forum for Innovative Development, Open Innovations, the plenary session, the emerging global innovation map, Closing the gap between countries begins now. Technologies uniting the world. Game changers and mega projects. China and New Horizons for Cooperation. The Open Innovations Forum 2014. Главный редактор журнала Россия. Chief editor of the journal Russia in Global Affairs, Fyodor Lukyanov. 全球政治中的俄罗斯杂志主编费奥多尔·卢基扬诺夫。Добрый день, дорогие друзья, уважаемые коллеги. Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen, friends, and I'm uh, uh, happy and pleased to welcome you here at the Open Innovations Forum. And this year, we are talking about the creative destruction. I believe the topic is extremely uh, contemporary. So it appeared 70 years ago as. Uh, uh, to testify uh, as a proof that the world is changing. And today, the world is changing very fast. I'm uh, happy to welcome our uh, guests, uh, um, chairman of the um, uh, government of Russia, Mr. Medvedev, and uh, uh, the um, chairman of the Chinese uh, People's Republic, Li Qingqiang. So, our plenary session on the topic has a name of the new innovation map of the globe. So, I believe this is a very exact, very accurate name. There are so many maps uh, of the world, uh, and probably uh, the one that's very important now is the one reflecting the innovation, where something new happens. And we have uh, two wonderful uh, people who will show us the geography and the way. Well, I'm not a specialist in geography, and I've never been, but I'll try. The most important is for the globe not to disappear. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, friends, I welcome you here in Moscow at the Thought International Forum Open Innovations. I would like to first of all give special thanks for participation to my colleague, Mr. Premier of the State Council of the People's Republic of China, Mr. Li Keqiang, and his big distinguished delegation from the People's Republic of China, which this year is a partner country of this forum. Our forum is quite young, everybody knows that, but the interest in this forum is increasing, and today we are glad to host guests from 47 countries of the world. Such a big number of participants demonstrates the fact that there is an interest in innovation agenda, and innovations are unifying as nothing else in the world. When we are talking about innovations, we are talking about things which are determining our future world. Technologies are shaping and transforming the world. They are changing our everyday life. And human capacities are broadening thanks to them. The topic of our plenary session is new emerging global innovation map. World economy is now searching for development sources. Today, the ability to create, promote, and to expand innovations is one of the key factors of competitiveness. And the countries of the Asian Pacific region have achieved impressive results in this sphere. I mean, China, India, Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, 
and it makes many think about the appearance of a new pole of global economic power. Russia is a country which lives both in Europe and Asia, and we're interested in strengthening our positions in the Asia-Pacific region. We are ready to jointly participate in forming new markets and involve in high-tech production chains and sources of added value. We believe that in this sphere, Russia and China have great opportunities for cooperation. We are connected by long-standing and solid ties with the People's Republic of China in all spheres from culture and humanitarian sphere to energy and industry. And the amount of high-tech products in our goods turnover is one of the highest with regard to Russia, although I must say frankly that there is a certain disbalance with the benefit of our Chinese partners. And we have to work more in our pro for our projects. Our scientific and technical cooperation is a multifaceted character. We are implementing joint products in fundamental and applied research. They cover such spheres as new materials, green and energy saving technologies, biotechnologies, chemistry and petrochemistry, machinery, electronics, instrument making, automatics, telecommunications, electronics, and many other fields. It is a good thing that academic and sectoral research institutes take part in the implementation of these projects, as well as scientific and production associations, state companies and private companies from different regions of Russia and China. Active role in inter-academic cooperation is played by the Russian Far East Federal University in Vladivostok. The Association of Technical Universities of Russia and China is operating. Students take part in joint conferences. They share their own ideas and uh, expertise. Uh, they get good experience of intercultural communication. Institutes of development are also strengthening their ties. So we discussed the opportunity of establishing joint special economic zones and venture funds. I hope that one of the concrete results of our today's forum where, where Ch China is a partner country will be the creation of new mutually beneficial Russian-Chinese projects, innovative projects. By the way, we're really glad that our Chinese colleagues will come to Ekaterinburg next year for the Inoprom exhibition where China will also be our partner country. Dear ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, now as a host of this event, of this forum, I would like to present to you Russian system of support for innovative activities. Uh, I would like to say a few words about what we have achieved and what we haven't achieved and what our problems are. It is obvious that this system is being created and it is far from being perfect, but innovative development, even at the most complicated times of economy remains our priority. I would like to, I won't go into details, I will only give you the main idea of this system in Russia. So the first thing that I wanted to say is that we have considerably increased state investment in innovation over recent years as provided for in the strategy for innovation development of Russia. We have established infrastructure for the support of innovation which can be compared to many systems existing in other countries. We have we have launched our basic institutes of development. I'm not going to mention all of them. Moreover, most people who are present here today know about them. I mean, Vnesh Economic Bank, Russia Venture Company, Rosnana, Skolkova Fund, and the Fund for Development Assistance to Small Businesses and a number of other funds and structures. I would only say that since 2007 till 2013, it is a period when we have, st we have started to deal with innovation for the first time. We have supported about 13,000 projects for a total amount of 700 billion rubles. The second thing, this, uh, beside being an, an 
invest in high-tech projects. State is a regulator of these spheres in many other countries. Today, we're trying to adjust this system in such a way so as to have the so-called innovation elevator, so that at every stage of an innovation project, from the conception of idea to the launch of mass pro production, entrepreneurs could have a necessary set of instruments of support. We have adopted a whole number of laws regulating innovation, innovations. I mean, those laws, uh, such laws as law on the fund of prospect of promising research, the law which allows research scientific institutes and universities to establish small scientific and technical ent enterprises and a number of other laws. And I believe that in the future, in order to develop this way, we'll also have to adopt uh, new laws and new legal acts and to adopt separate laws in this regard. We have uh, adopted state programs. Almost all of these programs include requirements for innovation development. The third thing, we are trying to increase the innovative potential of our major state companies. First, this task seemed to be quite complicated. In Russia, such companies play quite a significant role in Russia. They provide for one-third of the industrial production volume and about 40 percent of all internal expenses for research and development. This is quite a big amount. And uh, I have instructed uh, the companies to adopt programs of innovation development for such companies as Gazprom, Rosneft, Ross Technologies, Ross City, Ross Adam, Ross Telecom, and many other companies. They are increasing investment in research and development. And uh, frankly speaking, when I'm meeting the heads of these companies, they are demonstrating what they have been able to achieve for the last three or five years. The most important thing is to for this investment to bring good final results. So the fourth thing, state procurement is another factor which determines demand for innovation. The law on contract system sets forth the priority of supply of innovative and high-tech production. It sets, it envisages different economic mechanisms which stimulate the use of more efficient solutions including life cycle contracts. The contract system has to be more open for small high-tech companies. This is also one of the requirements of the law which I've just mentioned. Within the frame of the National Entrepreneurial Initiative, we are implementing the roadmap to broaden access of small and medium-sized companies to the procurement of infrastructure, monopolies, and companies with public ownership. And of course, uh, a certain role is being played by institutes of development in the sphere. The fifth thing, in order to launch new major joint industry projects, we have to concentrate uh, the resources of uh, state, science, and business. I have approved plans to develop biotechnologies, photonics, composite materials, new production technologies. These projects will all be based on state and private partnership. In a number of cases, we are planning to establish consortiums with the participation of producers and consumers of innovation products. Uh, major infrastructure companies, companies with public ownership, small and medium-sized high-tech enterprises and universities can participate in such programs. The sixth thing which I wanted to mention, we believe that territorial aspect in innovation policy is very important. We are now in Moscow, which is a major innovation center of Moscow. Moscow is the capital of the Russian Federation and one of the biggest cities of our country. And the platform which we are working here today at is very interesting. I see that it, it used to, to be a production site. And this is a good example of an efficiently priorities for development. It is a very good thing that the administration of Moscow makes its own priority to develop such innovations. But we're also trying to establish similar centers of innovations in other regions. We have achieved a lot in this sphere. I'm not going to mention all of these centers, centers but Many regions where, which I visit establish new centers for innovation, new techno parks, and innovation regional clusters. 
we already have 25 clusters of such kind. As a rule, they, they are located on the territories with high concentration of educational, scientific, technical, and production potential, including in science, cities, and uh, special economic zones. The seventh point, of course, all the system can't work without people, without scientists, engineers, highly qualified workers, specialists who are working in these centers are at the heart of any innovative system. And Russia has already formed its own network of federal universities, national research institutes, and leading scientific organizations. They are, their efficiency is evaluated in accordance with international standards. And uh, we have uh, invested uh, for recent years about 135 billion rubles in the development of research infrastructure and attracting leading foreign researchers. Another initiative is Global Education Initiative. And those citizens of Russia who want to enter master and postgraduate programs in the leading foreign universities will receive support from state. Dear friends, dear Mr. Premier of the State Council of the People's Republic of China, To conclude, I think we all have to remember quite a famous, quite famous and simple truth. I would like to quote the words of Bernard Shaw, who said, if you have an idea and I have an idea and we exchange these ideas, then each of us will have two ideas. Well, it's a very simple truth. and. I believe that our participants to our forum have much more ideas. I would like to wish interesting work to all the participants of the forum, useful business contacts which may in the future transform into useful scientific cooperation. We all want to see our regions, our countries as successful, contemporary, highly efficient countries and regions, and it is impossible to do without innovation technologies in the 21st century. I would like to thank you for your attention, and I am pleased to give the floor to my colleague, Mr. Premier of the State Council of the People's Republic of China, Li Keqiang. Thank you very much, Mr. Medvedev, for this detailed uh, trip uh, across the map of the globe. And I would be happy to pass the floor to the President of the um, uh, State Council of China. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, well, today it is my great pleasure to join you here in the Technopolis of Moscow for this International Forum for Innovative Development hosted by Russia. So please allow me to say Dobry Ding. And also on behalf of the Chinese government, I wish to extend congratulations on the opening of this forum. Innovation is the perpetual engine for the development and progress of humanity. The world today is undergoing major transformation and adjustments and calls for innovations of greater depth at a wider scope. Being fettered by old conventions or relying on one's own efforts will not lead to such innovations. What we need is openness, cooperation, and sharing. When the international financial crisis broke out six years ago, the international community, by pulling together, prevented the crisis from worsening and spreading. With further progress in economic globalization and IP, IT application, it is even more important for countries to join hands in pursuing cooperative innovation in order to realize a multiplication of knowledge and value 
overcome development challenges and achieve common prosperity. This is what the open innovations are all about. Open innovations include both cooperation in technological innovation and sharing of experience on systemic and institutional innovation. At the moment, new technologies are promoting profound adjustments in the global economic and industrial patterns, while the world economic recovery has been a bumpy road. Only when technological innovation and structural reform are combined to form a synergy, and only when the creativity and innovation potential of the people are fully unleashed, can we produce a strong momentum for global economic stability and recovery. During this process, countries should share innovation experience, narrow the innovation gap, and pursue inclusive development and development for all. In China, people are becoming more and more enthusiastic about innovation. At the summer Davos World Economic Forum held in Tianjin not long ago, there were heated discussions on the theme of creating value through innovation. My foreign friends often ask me, what is the secret behind China's sustained growth? Upon my arrival in Moscow, a journalist from a leading Russian television had an interview with me, and he asked it the exact question. So this is my answer. It relies fundamentally on the hard work and the wisdom of the Chinese people. The reform and the opening up of China involving more than 1.3 billion people is an innovation campaign of the largest scale in the world. Through such reform measures as empowering the farmers with the land operation rights, reforming the SOEs, and developing the private sector, we have fully stimulated the creativity of the multiple players in our economy. Many of our practices and systems which have been proven to be effective were all established in this process. And with the unleashed creativity of 10 of thousands of people, the society has gained a strong capacity to create wealth, and the people have become better off. Opening up is also a kind of reform. We have opened up to the world and enhanced our innovation capacity and competitiveness through opening up in wider scope and higher level, and so that Opening up will also help us to further promote reform. Science and technology have served as a pri primary productive force in driving China's development, and a robust scientific and technological sector would not be possible without reform. More than 30 years ago, in the capital city of Beijing, we started reform on national R&D institutions by allowing R&D professionals to start up their own businesses in the market platform so as to create their own values. Now, in many Chinese cities, the technological market is developing, and the technological companies are competing with each other in this market. Scientific and technological professionals are working hard through market competition, and uh, this vigor comes from systemic innovation. And China has made remarkable achievements. However, we also know clearly that China is still the l largest developing country. Its per capita income still ranks around 80th in the world. And it also trails far behind developed countries in science and technology. There are still much 
that remain to be done in improving the quality and efficiency of the Chinese economy. And China needs to become a moderately developed country by the middle of the century. And what is crucial is to further free our mind, persisting reform and innovation, and unleash the creativity of the people. And we must also tap the potential of all so that the whole society will be full of vigor and vitality, providing a reservoir of energy that propels development. First of all, we need to remove the barriers that constrain innovation. We are committed to building a pro-innovation government, and the top priority is to streamline administration and delegate powers. For the past year and more, the central government alone has removed or delegated to lower levels administrative approval on over 600 items, which means that we are giving more space and room for the market, lower the threshold for the access to the market. As a result, we have seen a massive upsurge in the number of newly established businesses, the majority of which are small and medium-sized ones. The SMEs needs to a large extent on innovation and creativity to develop and to survive. And we have been doing so in order to ensure that everyone with the willingness and ability to innovate will have the chance to succeed. And before that, we need to put in place an equal market access as well as opportunities to ensure fair competition. And we want to turn the 1.3 billion people demographic dividend into talent dividend. And if that is succeeded, we will ensure that such in reform and innovations are pursued to enrich and benefit the people and deliver all-round development for the people, an equitable society, and a sustainable economy. Second, we need to put in place mechanisms that encourage innovation. We will accelerate the reform of the science and technology system, improve the mechanism of R&D outcome utilization, proceeds distribution, and apply and give the innovators more autonomy in their research and the inventors will get their fair reward. It should be underscored here that all law-abiding businesses operating in China will receive national treatment. Foreign businesses enjoy the same preferential policies in their R&D activities. Their innovations are equally deemed created in China. Products and their brands, Chinese brands. We will also put in place social security and assistance system, assistance system covering the entire population so that all entrepreneurs and innovators will have a safety net to fall back on if and when they fail in this competition. And we hope that such a safety net will ensure that these people, after thinking on the lessons and experience of their failure, will engage in new endeavors for innovation leading to a final success. Third, we need to create an environment that protects innovation. China is committed to, to turn itself into the most attractive country for innovation and entrepreneurship, a country that offers huge market demand, represented by 1.3 billion people each year. The total volume of import exceeds Trillion, one trillion US dollars. We also need to build a sound legal system, a well regulated market, and an inclusive culture. In particular, we need to make continuous efforts to strengthen IPR protection and resolutely combat IPR infringements because protecting IPR means protecting 
the seeds of innovation and upholding the order of fair competition. Ultimately, fair competition and honest business operations can help both uh, help all companies to achieve sound development. In China, we often say that we need to change the model of economic development. And one way of changing such a pattern is to rely on innovation. And we need to achieve high quality, highly efficient growth uh, featuring more endeavors on environmental protection and energy saving. We also support enterprises in innovating their technologies management and business forms of businesses. And we need to unlock the huge potential and rely on innovation to remove all the bottlenecks on resources and energy. We also need to upgrade the economic structure in order to achieve leapfrog development of the Chinese economy. China's ec innovation is open innovation. We cannot pursue innovation behind closed doors. We are ready to engage with all governments, institutions, and businesses with a genuine interest in win-win cooperation. No matter how developed it becomes, China will always need to draw upon the strengths of other countries and keep introducing advanced technologies, managerial expertise from other countries. And it is the same uh, purpose and mindset in which we are having this visit to Russia. As each other's biggest neighbors, China and Russia enjoy huge potential of innovation cooperation. China is China and Russia are both countries with time-honored history. The Russian nation has produced many world-renowned writers, scientists, and musicians. While the Chinese civilization has also exerted a significant influence in the world. So China and Russia are both emerging markets, major countries in the world, and also countries that are strong in science and technology. Chinese and Russian scientists are driving innovation. Chinese and Russian artists and musicians are also driving the creativity of the human society. So this is also a kind of, of innovation. What we need is not just innovation in products, but also innovation in services. We should have both general purpose products, but also products that are tailored to individual demands. In order to achieve that, we will need innovation both in techno technologies and innovation in culture and arts. Cultural interactions between China and Russia can produce sparkles for innovation and creation. China is ready to strengthen cooperation in major projects of strategic significance with Russia. Deepen cooperation between non-governmental institutions and at subnational levels and also support SME cooperation through multiple means. We are also ready to work with Russia to promote institutional and systemic innovation in various forms. Ladies and gentlemen, the source of innovation comes from curiosity and also from the energy of the youth. The young people are most passionate about innovation. When I received the interview of the journalist from the Russian TV, actually the anchor is a young man. He asked me, and he said that uh, I am uh, full of energy when answering the question. I said I was inspired by his youthful energy in that interview. And 
I want to take this opportunity to invite young people from Russia and other countries to attend the China Innovation and Entrepreneurship Competition next year and demonstrate your talent to the world. The Chinese government will give full support to this event. And next year, it will be a year of youth exchanges between China and Russia. I believe that the interactions between our young people will surely produce new sparkles of uh, youthful energy. And uh, that will provide strong driving force for innovation. As this is a forum themed on innovation, it gives us more reasons to hope for the future. We hope the spark of wisdom will be will become a major engine uh, for innovation. I, to conclude, I wish the forum a full success. Uh, Spasiba. <coughs> So I would like to thank you for the very interesting uh, uh, presentation and really for the uh, wonderful, uh, brilliant metaphors that you shared. And in Russia, we would be we were saying that it's the spark uh, with, that will ignite the flame, and it really uh, reflects our idea that our innovations are a spark that will ignite this wonderful uh, flame, the fire of uh, development. Uh, it, to follow up. To follow up your uh, wonderful uh, presentations, I would like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Medvedev a question first uh, to you. So the, the topic that we are discussing today, is this creative destruction actually uh, uh, emerged once during the discussion about the role of state. So how the, company, the, the companies and state, private and public sector interact. So, and you mentioned the role of state companies in innovations. Could you like, could you please elaborate uh, uh, a little in your view what contribution the state companies uh, could uh, uh, make uh, into uh, facilitating this process? Contribution actually is determined by the role of state companies in one and another economies. We have a lot of state companies and they're represented in the key sectors of our economic life. Is it good or bad? Well, it's another issue, but it's evident that until we have the balance between the state uh, property and the private property, the role of state companies will be very high. This is the first thing I would like to say. The second is whether the state companies can be drivers of innovation development. My answer is yes, because it doesn't have to deal with the form of uh, property. This innovation development uh, doesn't do with it. It's um, an issue of the relation, human relation. It's the well-organized scheme of work. It's the um, stimulus uh, issue. And it's an issue of interest. So the situation are different. Some state companies are uh, doing it with uh, more uh, intent, more uh, avidness. But what I can say is that in five, six years, we have created such conditions when state companies can, can invest in innovations. And they are more actively involved in R&D. They have been involved in patenting their a project and pilot projects and their investigations inside the companies as well as uh, along the medium and small range companies which uh, also accompany the activity of big companies. And I would like to say that the state companies are able to do it. And the third thing that I would like to say and what is the uh, continuation of what I have said in my speech, it's very important what momentum is given to the state itself. What uh, objectives does the state uh, implement through uh, directorates uh, to state companies until the state is uh, conserve, con conserves the capital in and assets in these companies? We wanted to do that in the latest years, that practical all decisions, uh, the big decisions on big projects in big companies would be one way or another 
would have an investment proposal, investment offer from the part of innovation structures. So they would generate innovation areas. I consider that in the latest years we uh, achieved good results in this and we succeeded. And until the state companies are continuing working in those sectors that I have mentioned, they will in any case be um, creating innovation products and the objective of the state is to orientate them well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ali. So you uh, spoke at length uh, and you said very well about the uh, potential of creative people in innovations. So we know that uh, the economy of China traditionally grows uh, through uh, large investment into infrastructure and the exports. Uh, so, but we have observed that lately uh, in China, high tech companies emerged of a global scale. Uh, and uh, as for the uh, IPO success, you know, everyone is uh, watching, holding their breath. So, what's the reason of this success? What's the root uh, of your success in the technological area? And probably you see something that China could share with Russia in this respect. You have asked quite a number of uh, questions in one go. It's like a zero blast. You are quite a professional anchor, I can tell from these questions, and it also shows that you are quite familiar with China's economic growth. And I want to s emphasize that China is still a developing country. China has maintained rapid economic growth for more than 30 years. And in this process, our investment in infrastructure and exports to foreign markets have played an important facilitating role in driving growth. As a developing country, China needs large investment in public goods, and there is a huge potential to be tapped in the area of infrastructure development. Meanwhile, China also has 800 to 900 million of labor forces. The hardworking Chinese people have provided important foundation for China to become a major export nation. And these are the achievements that should be recognized. On the other hand, at the current stage, over-reliance on investment and export is no longer sustainable. That is because the largest potential of China still lies in consumption, and consumption is the ultimate demand. China is a country with a population of 1.3 billion, and if the 1.3 billion Chinese people can get a higher income, live a better life, they will spend more, and their, cons their consumption will give a much stronger boost to economic growth. Because of this, we are shifting the model of economic growth. With the purpose of striking a balance between investment, export, and consumption. In particular, we're trying to give consumption a fair share in driving economic growth. In order to do that, we need to consider 
the individual demands of consumers and in order to accommodate these personalized demands, innovation is really important. Innovation can not only help shape consumer habits, but also strengthen the weak links in infrastructure development and uh, help China improve its competitive competitiveness in exports. For example, we're now promoting high-speed railway development, which is also a result of innovation. This is not just a infrastructure project, but also a public service for consumers. And all these can only be achieved through innovation. Innovation's potential is limitless. Internet innovation is one latest example. Potential of internet innovation is even more limitless. Young people are fond of buying things on the internet and interacting with their friends through social media websites. This has paved the way for the development of logistics, express delivery, and other services. A modern service industry is going through a revolutionary change because of the evolution of internet technologies. I was I know that the theme of the forum is creative disruption. So my understanding is that we need to have revolutionary technologies to open up even broader prospect for human innovation. Actually, revolutionary changes are already taking place in the logistics sector. As you know, the evolution of uh, the economy, from commodity economy to market economy, logistics has really played a major facilitating role. And in this new age of uh, the internet, new forms of businesses have been created, which is triggering new changes in the logistics sectors. We will continue to encourage companies in these sectors to make innovation, and uh, we also hope that they will grow their business smoothly and healthily in order to bring benefits to the people. As for the secret of behind China's sustained growth. I already touched upon this issue during my keynote speech. And this is an open secret, actually. It is known to everybody in the world. China, through reform and opening up, has made tremendous achievements in economic and social development over the past 30 years and more. We will continue to rely on reform and innovation open ourselves wider to the outside world and ensure sustained and healthy growth of the Chinese economy. Whereas for what this means for Russia, I think there are a lot we can learn from each other. Cooperation between our two countries is based on the principle of mutual respect. In other words, we respect the path of development the other side has chosen in light of the national conditions. On the other hand, we also believe that openness is key to this cooperation. We should be open to each other, learn from each other, and also draw upon the fine achievements of other civilizations. 
And the ultimate purpose is to create benefits for the local people. And they must be aligned with local histories, cultures, and immediate needs. We are ready and willing to learn from Russia. Spasiba. So, if we follow up on the quotation from Bernard Shaw that uh, Mr. Medvedev actually recalled, so I believe uh, this after this plenary we shall have more than two ideas. Uh, actually, we shall have many because the parties have exchanged uh, very good ideas and, and uh, a lot of them. So I would like to thank uh, you, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman of the State uh, Council and, uh, 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 and Mr. Medvedev. And I wish I would like to wish you every success at the uh, at the forum today. Thank you.